All right. So we're on method of joints. Anyone work any problems in between Monday and now? The shaking heads of shame indicate that no, you have not worked any problems. Okay. <laughs> did, but not these. Okay. I noticed that you don't have a shaking head of shame. Huh. That's because you did homework. Impressive. If anyone would like to get rid of their shaking head of shame, homework is the answer. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so method of joints. Um, we're going to do something a little different. Okay. Okay, so I have this cantilever bridge trussy thing, holds a thousand pounds out at the edge there. We're going to say these are equilateral triangles and that each of these uh, little members, well, let's say they're each five feet, okay? So if they're all equilaterals, right, that means that all of these angles are 60 degrees. And I'll go ahead and do some labeling here. Let's go A, B, C, D, E, and F. Give you a second to get that in your notes. All of them are equilaterals except for this guy, right? He couldn't be an equilateral. Okay. Everybody got this in their notes? So I'd like you to determine for me the reactions at A and B as our first step, right? That's first step of these problems is typically finding the reactions at A and, uh, or the reactions that are external to it. So go ahead and figure out what the reactions at A and B will be. I'll give you a minute to do that. <coughs> No, finding the find the reactions at A and B. Yeah. So not not looking at the joint yet, but we're looking at the external loads, not the internal loads. So how much does what does A have to hold in order for this to be in equilibrium? What does B have to do for in order for this to be in equilibrium? Right, so we might have something like this. Okay. Can you do this without writing any, any equations? Can you look at it and tell me what you think? Okay. Yeah, I think Brendan's on the right track. But look at it without doing any equations. Okay. What would the thousand pounds over here cause the structure to want to do? Rotate, right? If this was a weightless bridge, okay, and it's got a support here, it's going to cause this to want to do this, right? What's that? Well, hold on. So all we just just think through what would what we need to do in order to keep this in equilibrium. If B is our fulcrum, it seems likely that we need to pull down with a thousand pounds over here to make it so that the moments cancel, 
right? If I sum my moments about B, there's a thousand pounds going down over here and nothing over here. So indeed, yes, I need a thousand pounds on this side. And you'd find that by summing your moments. You could either sum the moments at A or sum the moments at B. Secondly, now I say, okay, I have a thousand down here and a thousand down here. That means that BY has to be 2,000 up, right? Okay. And you can do that with equations, right? Some of the forces in the Y would give you that. You can see that AX is going to be zero. Um, but I want you to, I mean, it's good to just instantly go to writing the equations of equilibrium, right? That's step one in your development of a, a statics engineer, right? Step one is equations of equilibrium always. Step two in your developmental process would be looking at this and being able to see, oh, well, I can see that there's a twisty here, and where would I, where would I counteract that? Well, I'd counteract it over here, because if I sum the moments about B, all right, so I need 1,000 pounds in the opposite twisty direction. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then you'd be able to kind of get these in your head, or at least have an idea of what's going to happen, even if you don't have the numbers, be able to develop that kind of intuition of, of where those loads are going to be. All right? So we've got this. Good. All right? Now, uh, where would you guys like to start uh, using the method of joints? B? Why do you like A better than B? It has less members, less unknowns, right? B, we wouldn't be able to solve right now because we have one, two, three, four unknowns. Right? So yeah, go ahead and solve it A and tell me what you get. That's what I like to hear. From you. Yes, sir, right away, sir. You guys get equations that look like this? What did you find for FAF? FAF. Eleven fifty-five pounds. Okay. 
And then you should be able to find FAB. Looks like it's going to be negative, probably. 577? Okay. So it's negative, or we could say it's 577 and in compression, and this is in tension. Okay. We can't go to B yet, uh, so let's go to uh, F. All right, I'm not going to do it. I want you to just do it and tell me what uh, FFB is equal to and what FFE is. Okay. So you do it at your table and you tell me what you get for that. How did I get this 1,000? Yeah, so that's, um, if you sum the moments, if you treat it as a rigid body, and you sum the moments about B, right, then you have um, AY times 5 minus 1,000 times 5 equals 0, right? Yeah, and so then you would solve for that and see that it's a thousand. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. The question was, how do we get eight, uh, the thousand pounds down? And the answer is, if you sum the moments about B of the rigid body, you'd have uh, if this way is positive, you'd have negative a y times five minus five times a thousand, which would tell you that a y has to be negative a thousand, and there is. Great question. How do we know when it's in compression or in tension? We know that by always, in our free body diagrams, always drawing the unknowns in tension. And then when we get a negative answer, as we did with this 577, that says it's in compression. So we always, in a free body, if it's an unknown, we draw it in tension, meaning that it goes from the point away. And then if we get a negative answer, we know that it is in compression. And we say 577 was negative, then I added, changed it to positive and added the compression notation after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody got values for me yet? Uh, which angle? They're, they should all be, all these should be 60, right? Because they're equilateral triangles. 
right? So all the angles are 60. I guess this one would be 30. This one would be 60. Liana, do you have anything? What'd you get? Holding out on me. A thousand one hundred and fifty five pounds in compression. Okay. And zero for FE. I don't think that's right. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not right. Okay, so maybe I'm going to take it back and I will uh, do this one. So here's my free body diagram. We determined that FAF is 1155 in tension. So that means that we've got 1155 in this direction, right? And then our unknowns are going to be F. Fe and F Fb. All right, does your free body diagram, Leanna, look like this one? Ah, you had the 1155 going the other way. Yeah, that's a super common issue, right? So we found that FAF on joint A was in tension with 1155. That means that joint or the member AF is uh, pulling on A and in order for it to be pulling on A it also needs to be pulling on F for it to be in static equilibrium right they have to be equal and opposite right so if I find that here this arrow goes in that direction that means here the arrow has to go in the opposite direction for it to stay in equilibrium elsewise if I drew the arrow going the other way it would be telling me that I'm putting a ton of acceleration on this guy, right? Because its net force is going to be shooting in that direction. Okay? All right. So <clears throat> I blame Brendan, too. So let's sum the forces in the x and set that equal to 0. Looks like we're going to have negative 1155. Uh, and that angle, then, is going to be 30 degrees off of the vertical, right? Or it could be 60 degrees off of the horizontal. So it's going to be 1155 cosine 60 uh, plus FFE plus FFB, and that would be cosine 60 again. Right, because this angle here is 60. And all of that has to be equal to 0. And then we can sum the forces in the y direction and set that equal to 0. It looks like I'll have negative 1155 uh, sine 60 minus F, FB uh, sine 60 equals zero. So from this, the sine 60s cancel, right? And I end up with uh, FB is equal to negative 1155. F, FB is equal to negative 1155, or that means 1155 in compression. Up here? Yeah. No, because see, I have FFE that doesn't have a cosine 60. So the question is, would the cosine 60s cancel? And the answer is no, because FFE doesn't have that. If it did, we could factor them out, but it doesn't. Okay. So then we need to take my uh, negative 1155 and stick that back in here. right? So this is, this is the challenge, I think, as you're learning this, is that we know that 1155 was negative, but then we change it to positive and call it compressive. But when I substitute a compressive force back in here, I found that FFB is actually a negative value. 
and I need to use the negative, right? So let me rewrite this, some of the forces in the x. I have negative 1155 cosine 60 plus FFE plus FFB cosine 60 equals 0. But what I found in the step above is that FFB is actually negative 1155. <laughs> So now go ahead and uh, substitute that in there. It looks like I have negative 2310 cosine 60, or 2310 cosine 60 is equal to FFE. So FFE, I think it's going to be, a, is it 11? No. Yeah? I'm going to wait for someone to do that math for me because I'm not confident in my mental trig. You got 1155? That's what I was getting in my head. But, and that was intention, right? Uh, so, Brendan is saying, hey, they're all 60 degrees away from each other. Wouldn't they all have to be the same magnitude? Uh, yeah, but you just got to be careful that this one needs to be negative. Excuse me, it needs to be the opposite sign of these two for it to be in static equilibrium, right? Okay, okay so the answers are indeed not this, right? We ended up with FFE being 1155 and FFB in tension and FFB being 1155 in compression. What's that? Yeah, well. Okay. All right, so now um, we could keep doing this. I want to jump to uh, member or joint D, though. Let's do joint D. Okay, so my free body diagram at joint D is going to look something like this. F, D, C... F, D, E, right? <coughs> Everybody okay with this free body diagram? Okay. So let's sum the forces in the x direction and set them equal to zero. What has a component in the x direction here? Anybody? FDE. Anything else? Let's do another one. Some of the forces in the Y. What has a component in the Y? Anything else? So we have uh, already defined two force members, right? A two force member is any member where the loads are applied just at two points, right? And for in order for this member to be in static equilibrium, uh, can it be this? No, it can't be, right? In order for this guy to be in static equilibrium, we have two options. It can either be in compression or in tension. And we're saying that all of the trusses we're dealing with are made up of two force members, right? Because all of the loads are applied at the joint, okay? And so there are no three force members allowed, all right? A three force member is when I'd say, oh, boop, there we go, a third force application location. That makes it a three force member. Now we can't really do truss analysis. There's other things going on here, okay? Uh, I want to talk to you now about the zero force member, which we just found two zero force members, DE and DC. Okay. What? How much force do you think a zero force member has on it? Zero. Okay. 
there are two ways you can end up that you can quickly identify uh, zero force members, okay? So this is our new nugget for today, zero force members. Okay? Zero force members, two ways you can get them. The first way is any joint with only two members. that are not <coughs> collinear and where no force is applied. It doesn't actually have it. So the question is, does it have anything to do with the fact that they were perpendicular to each other? And the answer is no. It has nothing to do with the fact that they were in perpendicular to each other, it was just easier for me to show you right off the bat that they're going to be zero, okay? Okay, so any joint with only two members, not MIMBs, I need to put in an R, members that are not collinear and where no force is applied, both members are zero force members. Okay, so this could look like, um, oh, let's make a really simple truss. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, and maybe we apply a load right here. No loads are applied. On, I'll give you some letters A, B, C, and D. There's no load. If we looked at joint C, we can see that there's no load applied. Okay, they're not collinear. Therefore, these are both zero force members. Nothing is happening here. Okay, there's no load carried in C, D, and C, B. Now, actually, if we cut it open, there would be a load, right, just from the weight of the members themselves. But in truss analysis, we're pretty much always neglecting the weight of the members, right? We're not accounting for the fact that they have some weight to them. We're just saying they're weightless and they can hold stuff. And the idea with that is that the weight of the members is much, much less than their load carrying capacity, which is a good analysis. Like, if, if you think about it, like those pictures I showed you on Monday of the, of the bridges... Those are big, giant steel I-beams that the bridges are made out of. Are those weightless? No. I would not want one of those dropped on my toe. I mean, I work out with them in the morning. I have some big I-beams at home that I just pick up, you know, ah, yeah. Um, but, you know, lesser men would need a crane to pick them up, okay? <laughs> so, um, so they are indeed not weightless, but that weight is insignificant compared to the load that they can actually orders of magnitude different. So <clears throat> here, though, when we're looking at zero force members, if we had two of those I-beams that are off in this funny party hat shape, right, uh, we would call them zero force members, saying there's no load in them because there's no load applied there. This would immediately change if I uh, hung something off of this. No longer are these zero force members, right? So our, our first type of, or our first tool for finding a zero force member is to look for joints that only contain two non-collinear members with no load applied. If, that, if we can find a joint like that, we can just automatically say, whoop, zero force member. And so sometimes I like to put a little X on the members that are zero force members, okay? Because that tells me then I could actually because maybe previously I couldn't start my analysis at point B. But now if I identify BC as being a zero force member, I certainly could, right? Because there's only two unknowns there then, BD and BA. Yeah, collinear. What does collinear mean? So two lines are collinear.
So collinear is I have A, B, C, D, and E. AB is collinear with BC, meaning that it, it's sort of like it lies along the line of action, if you will. Right, they're in a straight line. They're collinear. They're on the same line. Uh, a, B, B, E, not collinear. Right, so collinear just means they're on the same line. All right. Yeah, no problem. Good question. So let's, uh, I'm going to just, we're going to flip through and see if we can identify, um, I'll zoom out as far as I can to get as much of this page in here. Okay, so um, let's look at some goofy shapes and see um, if we can find some zero fourth members. Gosh, they are not that meet this definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to draw, draw you some because there aren't enough there. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, I'm going I'm to go ahead and give you the second rule before we go, and we'll go on a Zero Force member hunting expedition. Okay. So the second case is when... Uh, any three-member joint where two members are collinear. What's that mean? They lie in the same line. Where two members are collinear and no load is applied, then the non-collinear member is a zero force member. You're good? All right. So let's say, let's draw our bridge here. And these ones, I'll tell you that this one is a more common scenario. All right, so we've seen bridges like this. I think a couple of the ones that we looked at the other day had completely vertical members that went down, right? Okay, so we're looking for three-member joints. So let's see, is A a three-member joint? It's a two-member joint. Okay, so is there a load applied at A? There is. So we know that AH and AB are not zero force members, right? So we can go to our rule up above here and say, hey, it's a two-member two joint, but there is an external load applied, <coughs> applied, right? There'd have to be some AY to keep this guy in static equilibrium. Okay, so no zero force members there. Um, let's go to B. Is it a three-member joint? Yeah, right? A, B, B, C, B, H. So... Okay, it is a three-member joint. Are two members collinear? Yeah, A, B, and B, C are collinear. Cool. Is there any zero force member here? No, why not? Because there's a load at P, right? So if you think about this, 
Uh, could A, B, or B, C resist any of the load caused by P? They're in the wrong direction, right? They're perpendicular to it. So if we summed our forces, say, in the Y, there'd be no component of A, B, or B, C. It'd be all B, H, right? So we could actually just look at this and say that B, H has the same magnitude as P, right? Because A, B, and B, C can't carry any load. So BH has to carry all of the P load, all right? No, not necessarily. So the question was, would A, B, and B, C be zero? And the answer is not necessarily. We just know none of these are zero force members. We can't automatically say that any of them are zero force members, okay? All right, so let's go to joint C. Does this fit either one of our conditions? It doesn't, right? There are five members there, all right? Uh, how about joint D? Does this fit any of them? Absolutely, right? It's a three-member joint. Two members are collinear, and no load is applied. Then which one of these is, by definition, a zero force member? FD, right? There is one other zero force member in this. Where is it? GC, GC right? Because if I look at joint G, three members, two of which are collinear, no load applied, has to be a zero force member. Okay? This, it's fine if you don't see these immediately. Um, they're, rarely that will mean that you won't be able to solve the problem, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, you'll just be chugging along solving the problem, and you'll get something's equal to zero, and you'll take your hand and insert it onto your forehead like that, and be like, I wish I'd seen that earlier, right? Okay. Yeah, right. So it does look as if HF is just one long two-force member. And indeed, once you eliminate this, if you know HG, you know GF, right? So if, if I know this is a zero-force member, then I sum the forces in the X, if I know HG is maybe 10 pounds in tension, then I know GF has to be 10 pounds in tension too, right? Okay. So let's go on a zero force member hunt. Those are the only two. Okay. Who can find a zero force member anywhere on this page? Okay, which uh, you're going to have to shout out the number. Number eight, that's this one. HF, does it fit? It does. Joint, and you know that because joint F, right? Joint F has three members, two of which are collinear, no load applied. HF has to be zero force member. So one has to ask, why would HF be there, you think? What's that? If there was a load, sure. If there was a load, it would support it. Lance, what'd you say? To hold the shape, to hold the shape right? So uh, maybe steel's only available or it's easier to transport in 20-foot lengths instead of 40-foot lengths, right? So I'm going to put two pieces together. EF is 20 feet and FG is 20 feet. And then I'll hang something down from the top to hold it there, right? That could be a reason. Another reason is um, exactly what Joseph said. Uh, what if I drive a truck across this, right? If I had a truck sitting at F and there was no member HF there, would member EG be a two-force member? Nope. It's got a load on it, right? Okay. So it, you often add these just for stability of the shape while you're putting it together, right? Or to make it so that you could make member EG if that was super long, you'd have to make it a super big beam if it's carrying a big load in the middle, right? So perhaps you change it and say, well, I'm just going to hang something down here so I don't need as big a beam going in the horizontal, all right? Who else can find me another two-force member, or excuse me, zero-force member? JD on the same problem. Oh, that is tricky. Is it or isn't it?
Is is JD a zero force member? It is. It absolutely is a two force member. How do I know? The load's being applied at D. If I go to joint J and look at this, right? So if I make the problem like that, you would clearly say, totally, J, JD is a uh, zero force member. And you're right. Because if this carried any load, if JD had any load in it, would uh, KJ or JI be able to combat that load or resist that load? No. It doesn't have any component in the Y direction. Okay? So, agreed. If you look at D, you can't tell that JD is a zero force member. If you look at J, though, where there's only three, two of which are collinear, no load applied, yes, JD is a zero force member. Okay? Good job. Somebody find another one on this page. GC right here, okay, it actually would not be. So let's run through our, because I got a load on it, exactly. So it is a three-member joint, two of them are collinear, but I have a load applied. So uh, GC is not a zero-force member. There is one with a G on here. Lance, where are you, where are you looking? 10, GB, absolutely, zero-force member, because I look... At joint G, AG and GF are collinear. GB has, is not, and it has no load applied. So GB is indeed zero force member. EC would be the same situation. Okay. Let's see. Um, what about if we look down at this goofy telephone pole looking thingamajigger? Um, what about joint I? I have two, uh, IH and IA are collinear. So can I say anything about this? I can't. It doesn't follow my rule, right? Because my rule says any joints that only have three members, two of which are collinear. This has four members, right? So I really can't say anything about this one, okay? What about uh, joint F? Anything to be said there? Nope, right, because four members again. It's possible, and in fact, looking at this, I would say that uh, HF and FD likely are zero force members. Like if you think about this, think about how the loads are applied. Well, I guess maybe not, if these were symmetric. If there were 1,600 pounds on each side, right, then would you, could you see with me that HF and DF are likely zero force? Because that would just put GE in tension, right? We can't necessarily say that because they're not symmetric. They don't have the same loads on them, okay? All right. How about uh, in 40 here? Is G, can we say anything about G? Is GC zero force member? No, there's no load at GC for adjoint G. It's not collinear, right? HG and GF are not collinear, okay? What about joint D? Any zero force, it's got a load, right? So we can't just eliminate that. All right. Any zero force members here? GC, right? Because, again, it's tempting to say no because you look and there's a load applied at G. But if I look down at joint C, no load applied, three members, two of which are collinear, GC is a zero force member. So we could eliminate it and the truss would stay in the same shape. There's not, uh, there's not many with the first rule. True, um, there's one in this problem. Joint D, right? It's a two-member joint, no loads applied, 
Both DE and DC have to be zero force members. What about joint A? Joint A looks the same. I don't see any loads applied there. It would have reactionary loads at A, right? So at A, there's a connection, and so there's a reactionary load. So we can't say that it's a zero force member. Tempting, but we can't do it. All right? CF and CE? CB. CB. Nope, because you, the joint you'd have to be looking at to do that would be C, and there's four members in it, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'd like you, uh, you're not going to enjoy this. I guarantee it right now. You will not enjoy what I'm about to tell you to do. Okay. I would like you to solve this problem using method of joints. Okay? So I'm going to pause the video. I want you to, we're going to spend 10 minutes at least probably, maybe 15 minutes. I want you to sit at your table, talk to your table mate, and I want you to solve the loads in this guy. Okay? All the way across, soup the nuts, every joint. I want every one of them done. Is there anything you can eliminate right off the bat? Uh, DJ. DJ, right? Okay. But I want you to solve this using method of joints uh, for every single member. Okay. All right. Okay. So we are almost out of time for class, and we have only made it to joint L. Um, so a couple things here. Uh, I was hoping to go and show you uh, something else here, but I need you to finish this as homework, right? And I need you to do at least four, one, two, three, four method of joints problems, okay? Minimum before Friday. Sure, any of them. I need you to do four method of joints problems by Friday, okay? Has to happen by Friday. Do four. One, two, three, four method of joints problems. You can count this as one of them. I'll give you that. So just three more. Okay? Yep, you don't need to turn it in, but I need you to do it. So if you're watching this video, do method of joints, four problems before you watch the next video. Got it? No. Nope. Find, find them all is what I'm asking you to do for this one, okay? And uh, I have posted the homework problem in the homework section. It will be due on Monday. It has method of joints in it. So to do that, do the method of joints <laughs> before Friday. Does it count as one of my problems? Oh, my gosh. The question is, can that count as one of your problems? No. It can't because you didn't do any homework in the last few days, and I need you to do homework, right? You've got to do this or you're not going to get it. So in class, we struggled a little bit with finding the reactions at A, Y, and G, Y. You would not be struggling with that if you had done even just four problems. You will know how to do that. It's all it takes, four problems. You've suffered through three hours of me lecturing on this now, so please spend the half hour to do some problems, okay? All right, I will see you on Friday. Yes, question. Then you dropped, you didn't put it in your calculator, right? You dropped a zero someplace. 